So thank you so much for skipping around to the end of this secret session. Uh, it's hard, I think, sometimes Saturday morning to, to be fully engaged in psychology. Um, but my name is Min, and um, I'm a senior at Yale. And this study that I did called the attention of the symmetry between blacks and whites for incubin healthy faces um, was conducted for my senior thesis um, requirement at Yale. So, Attentional asymmetry between blacks and whites simply mean that, means that blacks and whites pay attention to different cues in their environment um, differently at different levels. And this is an old idea that has undergone the test of time, and, and there's a rich literature on, on this exact concept. Um, and then we go through three different asymmetries that have been looked at in the past before getting to the one that I've studied. So, Susan Fisk um, is a powerful psychologist at the, um, and, and she does a lot of work on power and attention. And what she's found is that the powerful tends to not pay as much attention to the powerless as the powerless would pay attention to the powerful. Because the powerful, their outcome is not dependent on the powerless. On the other hand, the powerless, their outcome is fully dependent on the powerful. So you can see this in pop uh, culture with Devil Wears Prada, <laughs> where the powerless has to pay a lot of attention, as you can see here, to this all-powerful um, editor. And she, you know, every little detail she has to pay attention to, right? What kind of coffee the powerful wants, uh, what kind of flower the powerful likes, and what kind of bags. So even just from pop culture, you can intu intuitively um, understand how this attentional asymmetry might play out. And historically, in America, blacks have been in the powerless position, whereas whites have been the powerful, more powerful position uh, going way back, even before the founding of our country, to the times of um, slavery. And even today, uh, you would see in, with the wealth gap, with the achievement gap, with the income gap, that blacks are still in the less powerful position. So what I was going to say is that we can then anticipate that um, Blacks and, and whites have this kind of um, attention asymmetry because of the differences in the levels of power. Another kind of asymmetry that you can see is the social identity threats. So when your identity is threatened, you tend to be more vigilant to cues that threaten your identity. So women in one study um, who were anticipating to interact with a sexist experimenter tended to um, pay more attention to subliminal cues um, that are relevant to their identity. Women who were not expecting to interact with a sexist experimenter did not pay as much attention to subliminal cues that threatened their female identity. The third kind of asymmetry um, is something that my advisor, Valerie Cordy Vons, looks at, and something that David earlier talked about, is this social identity contingencies um, asymmetry where blacks um, pay more attention to uh, contingencies that, that are based on their settings. So, for example, uh, what David talked about with corporate settings, um, blacks trusted more um, organizations that have high minority representation. So this is a contingency that, that, that leads to this attentional asymmetry, where when you look at white participants, the trust for low minority representation corporations and high minority representation corporations are the same. So we've seen that the powerless pay more attention, members of stigmatized groups pay more attention to identity uh, threats, to more identity contingencies, but the present research that, that I conducted really looked at whether all these three asymmetries are facilitated by an automatic attentional process. And because you know, this is an old idea, right, that, that the, the powerless pays more attention to the powerful, and, but the, the new research that, that we're conducting here is whether this can be captured at an automatic level, a, a level where we're not conscious of it. So how do we do this? We use what's called the rapid zero visual presentation paradigm to test this um, idea. And RSVP is a method of displaying very, very rapidly presented stimuli. Um, and your task is to identify some targets in this stream of stimuli that's rapidly presented. And RSVP's streams are designed to induce what's called the attentional link. 
And the attention of blink is the tendency to miss the second target in the stream when the first target is um, something that's interesting or something that's threatening. So they done uh, past research with RSVP streams have been conducted with social phobics, uh, sorry, spider phobics, where when presented with the first target of a spider, spider phobics are more likely than those who are not spider phobics to miss the second target. So talking about this is a little bit for you to kind of understand what an RSVP stream is. So let me um, just show you very quickly. So this is an, an example of, um, of an RSVP stream in our particular study. Um, and you'll see that the first target is a face, and the second target is a rotated natural scene. So um, in, in your job is to tell me whether the, the second target, the rotated natural scene, is rotated to the left or to the right. And at first, you'll be astounded about how quickly this is. Um, are you ready? Okay, there we go. <laughs> left or right? <laughs> right? OK. Um, you, you're not um, told when you're doing the study whether you got that correctly or not um, at all. So, next one. Left, right. So, we're not really sure, right, uh, when, when you're doing this sort of, uh, um, sort of uh, distracted. Uh, but participants are actually rather good at, at doing this. Um, it's about 70% accuracy rate on average. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So, in, my, um, in the RSVP stream that, that we looked at, um, we told participants when they came to the lab that this is a study on video games and whether um, people's level of interest in video games uh, correlate with their responses to rapidly presented stimuli. So this is what we told participants um, the study was about and that the task was to, in each RSVP stream, to pay attention to the one face and the one rotated natural scene and then to tell us whether the rotated natural scene was rotated to the left or to the right. So in our screen, you see natural stimuli, um, and all the stimuli are presented at 100 milliseconds per stimulus. And the target one is a face. Um, and this face is supposed, because you're told to pay attention to it, um, it's supposed to be interesting um, enough that, that you're drawn to it, and you find it more difficult to disengage from it, and therefore, the attention of blink is induced. And then this target two is a rotated natural scene. And remember that your T2 task is to tell us whether the rotated natural scene is rotated to the left or to the right. And then there are more stimuli in the set. And we use three lags. Um, and lags are basically the position of T2 relative to T1. So we use lag one, where T2 is immediately uh, following T1, so in the first position after T1. Lag two, as you can see here, is T2 is in the second position um, following T1. And then we also did uh, lag four, where T2 is in the fourth position following T1. We uh, ran 51 participants, um, and uh, as you can see, uh, whites and blacks, um, females and males, and they were all Yale undergraduates. The dependent variable here was whether you got correctly the direction of rotation um, of the rotated natural scene. And the independent variable is the rays of the face, so the rays of T1, and there were three. There was black, there was white, and there was Asian Indian. And from now on, I'm just going to refer to Asian Indians as Indians. Um, the lag, so there were three lags, right? The, you saw lag one, lag two, and lag four. And so you see these are the, the three types of faces. And so this design is a three by three by two. So at the very first level, you have the lag, one, two, four, 